Start the microphone, please. Yeah, I think the technician have to Hello? turn it on. Oh, is it okay? Uh, you have uh, eight minutes each. Just because we're starting a little bit late. Could you make it? Oh, yeah. I, you know, I'll make it just. Colleagues, would you please come back to your seat and we start second session, please. Can, can you please move to your seats as we are starting uh, the second session? So... Uh, excuse me, sorry, the mic doesn't work. Technician uh, taking the break. <laughs> okay, they are taking coffee. Okay, so can you please can you please move to your seats as uh, we are about to start the second session? Please take your seats so that we can start session two, please. Okay, so we're running a, we're running a little bit uh, um, running a little bit late. Uh, so let's start uh, this second session on uh, the MF role in crisis resolution. Um, and uh, you know, as we have seen in the previous session, uh, surveillance uh, may have a, a heart, may have a soul, may lack teeth. However, but uh, um, there is a framework uh, in the context of. Uh, crisis resolution, in particular debt restructuring, I'm not sure that we can really say that we have a framework. And uh, we know the IMF is working on uh, some proposals that uh, the executive board might be considering uh, over the next few months. The US Treasury is also working on a report. Um, we at CG have also been working on uh, uh, some research, some proposals. and. Um, and likewise, uh, uh, our partners, uh, Peterson and the IIF. So, um, without further ado, uh, let me uh, call on the uh, first speaker, Anna, a senior fellow here at Peterson, and uh, as many of you know, a professor at Georgetown Law. Uh, Anna, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Domenico, and uh, it's an honor to be here. This is, as you've heard many times, a very uh, important time uh, about for thinking about the IMF and uh, its role in crises. Um, I will probably channel some of the existential tension uh, themes that you heard uh, in the preceding uh, panel. Um, I will focus uh, the bulk of my remarks on the broader issue of the IMF's role in the financial crisis, and then I will uh, come back to debt restructuring in, in particular, if time permits, and if not, we can talk about it um, in the Q&A. Um, now, when I looked at the title of this panel, I thought, my goodness, how can an institution be at once completely indispensable and equally indefensible? Right? I mean, it was a really um, stark thing to think about because on the one hand, as a matter of fact, the IMF is the indispensable anchor for crisis containment and resolution, whether you like it or not. Right? It is charged with systemic stability and balanced growth globally. 
Right? The IMF was macroprudential before there was macroprudential. I mean, something to think about. Um, it has a mandate to correct maladjustments in individual members' balance of payments, a role analogous to the lender of last resort addressing liquidity problems. At the same time, it is also the preeminent restructuring lender addressing solvency problems when a country's debt is unsustainable to use the jargon, um, and in return it gets informal repayment preference and adequate safeguards, credible reform um, for IMF resource, to safeguard IMF resources. Finally, it is de facto the arbiter of reorganization plans, like a bankruptcy judge, and if we're honest, also the principal designer of these plans, determining the role for all the other players. Right, so having described it that way, and by the way, that's all out of Article One of the Articles of Agreement, right? I didn't make it up. Um, it is not hard to see why so many people think that the fund's role in this space is completely indefensible. Um, criticizing the IMF for crisis response must be the lowest hanging fruit on the planet, right? Um, its policy diagnosis is wrong. Its policy design is wrong. It lends too little. It lends too much. It is hopelessly conflicted and therefore illegitimate. Now, it is not just that some of these statements are true some of the time. All of these statements have got to be true at any given time, depending on your view of the IMF mandate and mission. Right? If you think of it as a lender of last resort, it's always lending too little. If you think of it as a restructuring uh, lender, well, then it's always bailing somebody out, and it shouldn't do it. Right? And that's just inherent to what the fund is. Now, one response to this um, realization is to just dismantle the IMF and have standalone functional alternatives. Macroeconomic financial surveillance body, a lender of last resort, a restructuring debtor and possession type lender, an expert consultant, and an impartial tribunal. Each of these would make for a terrific policy proposal with the inestimable virtue of being not the IMF. Right, so you could literally just have a policy paper proposing an institution doing all of this, but each of these would have to be designed to have global financing capacity, expertise, and political legitimacy. Right, so you would have to have these pieces, not each of them would have to have the financing capacity, but at least one would have to have global financing capacity. All of them would have to have legitimacy. All of them would have to have expertise. Um, the genius and the sheer chutzpah of the Bretton Woods designers, if I may use that term, you have to have chutzpah to be a founding father of anything, I suppose, um, is to design an institution capable of combining these functions that had a, has a decent but not perfect claim on both technocratic and political legitimacy, right? Now the fund at its best, I would argue, emerges precisely from this tension among these different aspects of the mandate. It cannot lend freely like a traditional lender of last resort because it has the express mandate not to add to the unsustainable debt burden. And it has a responsibility for the adjustment policy mix. Um, right, so the IMF actually, when I started thinking about this, it is unique of all institutions anywhere um, for having the capacity to recognize and act on the fact that the line between illiquidity and insolvency is a total fudge, right? There is no other institution like that. Um, there are institutions that have to you know, hold their nose and pretend it's all illiquidity. There are others that can go ahead and say it's solvency. The IMF at all times is both, and herein lies the tension. Similarly, the IMF cannot simply ignore the spillover effects or the precedent it sets because of its global mandate. Right, so a bankruptcy judge doesn't have to, for the most part, worry about the spillover effects uh, of Lehman, right? Um, and has very limited tools and mandate to address such spillover effects. That's not the fun story. Um, as a universal institution with both a surveillance mandate and a financing mandate, the IMF can and must address both individual cases of distress and systemic spillovers. Um, finally, it cannot ignore political capacity for adjustment um, or the political will of its members to finance adjustment. Um, and yet, by definition, it is an international institution that has got to be apolitical. So this is really hard. You have multiple mandates, policy tools, and accountability demands that by definition have got to create uncertainty, which then sows doubt about efficacy and accountability, and that can turn into a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
So in the remaining couple of minutes, um, I want to talk a little bit about the IMF and debt restructuring and then bring it uh, back to the fruits of existential tension. So the IMF's role in debt restructuring is residual. Right? It follows from other aspects of its mandate. It doesn't have a mandate to have countries go restructure their debts. Um, in addressing the members' balance of payments problems um, with adequate safeguards on its own resources, um, the fund has got to recognize both the limits on adjustment and the limits on available resources. The gap between those two gives you debt restructuring. Right? Um, that requires difficult just, um, judgments on political adjustment capacity, um, the availability of market financing, and non-market, also known as political, resource availability. Um, it also implicates the fund in the restructuring process, so the timing, the method, right? And how does that happen? Three steps. First, debt sustainability analysis, the diagnostic starting point for burden sharing. Um, and there we have seen a lot of uh, improvements since 2002 in rigor and transparency, and most recently with public availability of tools. Um, second, lending policies, which is really de facto restructuring conditionality. This is where the restructuring conditionality, such as it is, comes from. Policies on normal and exceptional access, which I'm sure uh, Susan will talk about. Lending into arrears, securing financing commitments. And then the third piece of it is policy advice, and that is where you get contract reform and debt management policy. Now, some say that you can have some of these tools, but not all of them. If you got the DSA right, the debt sustainability analysis, and if you had just the right contracts, restructuring will happen organically. Um, I strongly disagree with that. I think that the power is, and the burden for the fund, is precisely in the combination, right? The ability to change contracts does not translate into willingness to change contracts, just as ability to pay is not the same as willingness to pay. Um, now note also that this is a whole lot of tools. The IMF today can insist on restructuring and establish financial parameters for restructuring and influence the method of restructuring with no new tools whatsoever. Right? So then with that, we have to think about what has the track record been? Have we seen with all these tools um, a bias in favor of restructuring um, or perhaps against it? Right? And that's where the debate is. Um, which, in conclusion, brings me back to politics. Right? Um, the judgment when to restructure and how much to restructure is an irreducibly political judgment um, that implicates the debtor's capacity to adjust, economic and political, um, and the fund member's willingness to put resources on the line as well as suffer contagion. Okay? Um, in that context, knowing that the, the politics is irreducible here. The fund is going to be implicated in a political judgment and it's going to come under political pressure. Political accountability is crucial. Um, and that's what's at the heart of preserving the IMF as a legitimate global institution. This in turn has three dimensions. Um, one is financing and governance, which we're going to hear a lot about in the next session. Second, something I want to highlight, and that is tool clarity. And third is public engagement. So by tool clarity, I mean aligning tools to the various mandates um, and making the methodology and the choices transparent. Right? So having a lender of last resort facility, right? so the, this is the FCL analog, um, as distinct from a standby, as distinct from an extended facility, is important. Okay? Um, transparency in, in uh, debt sustainability analysis and the methodology is similarly important for these legitimate political legitimacy reasons. Right? And finally, public engagement and information disclosure, as well as pushing member governments for transparency, is also critical, um, not just for the markets, smart, dumb, big, small, but also for the broader political legitimacy that unfortunately we're seeing the fruits of in the um, recent congressional debates. Um, so considering the unavoidable um, centrality of the IMF to crisis architecture, its multiple mandates and tools, and the lack of plausible alternatives for now, I think the most important thing to do is to really refocus along these three dimensions, um, and it's also the least we can do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Let me call on uh, Susan Shadler, CG Senior Fellow. Thanks, Domenico. Um, first of all, I like the question posed by this conference. Uh, it's a good wake-up question. 
And I can't resist the opportunity to go on record to give my answer. I see the IMF as a gift from a previous generation, the immediate post-war generation specifically. It's common to hear the thought that if the IMF didn't exist, it would have to be invented, but I'm not so sure. I imagine that the hurdles that would have to be overcome in, and the debate that would have to be held in today's fractious global debating society would be a real uh, difficult hurdle to overcome. So I'm not so sure that leaders would give birth to, you can't hear? It's off. <laughs> okay, maybe it's that I'm too close. Is this still an echo? A little bit. Um, I, d I don't think that the IMF would be reinvented. So it is indeed a gift from a previous generation, and it seems to me the task of our generation sure. is to preserve it. So that's why I like this conference, and I think the main thing one has to think is continuously what is going to preserve the IMF. Now, obviously stripped strip to its core, the IMF has two functions, surveillance, information exchange, data collection, all of that in one bucket, just discussed, and the second is crisis mediation. That's what this session's about. Now, the big event in the past few years, the, the event um, which is going to stand out in 10 years when the history of the fund is updated, um, was the way the fund behaved itself in the EZ crisis. Um, the fund was faced with the most severe and the most globally important crisis since the mid-1990s. Um, First with Greece and then with a number of other European countries. I'm going to focus on Greece because in many respects what was done in Greece set the path for the future. Now to understand what the IMF did in Greece and how important it was, you have to really go back to the legacy of the crises from the 1990s. There was appreciation at the end of that. Um, it was arduously debated during the 1990s and the early 2000s that the IMF needed to distinguish clearly between crises where a country with a stabilizing package of policies was going to be able to service its debt and crises where a country, even with the strongest policies you could imagine the country implementing, was not going to be able to stabilize its debt, to be able to service its debt in the future. So it was going to need a restructuring. This was the lesson that came out of the 1990s. There needed to be a clear distinction between these two. Now, um, in, in the former set of countries, ones that could be conceived as having debt sustainability with the right policies, um, a conventional IMF loan was going to be of significant benefit. In the latter set of countries, the politically dreaded necessity of restructuring before the IMF committed resources was essential. This stark reality that was absolutely core to the IMF's credibility and effectiveness in crisis management was then encoded in 2003 in what rather arcanely are called the four criteria for exceptional access. So it's got a really arcane name that nobody in the outside world can understand except people, not only people who work in the fund really understand it. Um, these are not criteria in the performance criteria sense of the word, which most people are conversant with, what a country has to do to get the funding from the IMF. They're really criteria that the fund itself has to meet in order to go ahead with a loan to a country that's in distress. The crux of these criteria is that the IMF must assess that the country can and will be able to repay its debts without a restructuring of privately held debt, and that it will regain market access during the life of uh, the fund resources being outstanding. So it, it needs to say, we don't, we don't envisage that the restructuring is going to be needed, and if 
the fund can't reach that assessment, it needs to say we need to restructure and then we'll go ahead with the loan and with the policy of, uh, package of policies. Now, of course, the story of Greece is that the fund rather willfully walked into a train wreck. The IMF changed the rules, changed the four criteria that it had set for itself in the aftermath of the Asia crisis. Um, it introduced formally during the very session of the executive board that approved the loan to Greece, option, a permanent option for countries to waive, or for the fund to waive the requirement that a country uh, will be sustainable without a restructuring. So effectively, the lessons of the 1990s were thrown out in an afternoon session of the executive board meeting. Most executive directors didn't even know that this was going to come. They were surprised at the board meeting. Now, if you work in the fund, this is, this is sort of unimaginable because things in the fund, first they get proposed, the staff debates them, then capitals debate them, then the board debates them, and after many, many, many rounds of debate, a policy change might get made. This was done in a stroke like that, permanent. This change allowed the fund to lend to Greece without debt sustainability, and we now actually have a record, thanks to the Wall Street Journal, of what happened in that board meeting, where several executive directors, including the executive director from the United States, asked for a reaffirmation of the fund's preferred creditor status, implicitly because, or explicitly, if you work in the fund and know fundees, that there was going to be a restructuring needed in Greece and it was being pushed down the line. So this was bad for Greece. It contributed to the prolongation of the Euro crisis and it was particularly bad as a precedent for the future in the IMF. It leaves open the question now of what is going to prevent this kind of political manipulation of the fund which undermines its effectiveness and its credibility in the future. Well, there are pretty much two and a half options here. First, the half, um, some form of debt restructuring mechanism. Now, I don't say this to trivialize the importance of a debt restructuring mechanism. I actually wholeheartedly support uh, some, some sort of mechanism um, being put in place. But even if such a mechanism existed, even if we overcame all these hurdles and something was put in place, it has to be used, and the only reason it would ever be used is because the fund, or really, to put it more bluntly, the members of the fund are going to have to be able to constrain the political influences that drive decisions like that made in Greece. So this is half an option only because it would help if it were there, but it's not going to overcome the politicization problem of these lending decisions in unsustainable circumstances. So what are the other two options? Well, first, obviously, one could reinstate the four criteria. One could say, we made a big mistake. We now see from the euro crisis that this was a really silly and costly thing to have lent to Greece and not to have insisted on an upfront restructuring. We're going to go back to the old criteria and uh, perhaps a little implausibly, we're really going to stick to them this time. So it's got, it's got some credibility problems, but still, I'd say overall that would be the desirable way to proceed going forward. Now, another option is, and what I would consider to be a far inferior option, is to chart a different path to disciplining the fund, and that concerns the fund's preferred creditor status. Now, I, as just an aside here, I did a project last year for CG in which I looked at the, the reasons why the four criteria were changed. I actually went out as objectively as it was possible to be, interviewed about 30 to 35 key figures in this decision to lend to Greece and change the four criteria and ask them, were there good reasons to do this? Is there something that we and the public aren't really appreciating? And I wrote a paper on it, and I think fundamentally came to the conclusion that um, changing the four criteria had, had not been a good idea. But when I presented this paper, and I'd see many faces um, that were there when I was presenting this in various fora, the question that always came up was, well, what about the fund's preferred creditor status. What does all of this changing the criteria say about giving the fund this very privileged position of preferred creditor status? Now, I 
My years at the fund rival, I think, anyone else's in this room, and I've drunk the Kool-Aid. The Kool-Aid in the fund is preferred creditor status is absolutely essential to the fund doing its job. The fund lends in the various risky circumstances in the world. It lends at below market interest rates. Preferred creditor status both allows the fund to lend in these circumstances. It provides the security to its members who are committing their own resources. And it's compensation for the fact that we're lending at a very low interest rate. Um, now, there's also no denying uh, that preferred creditor status carries moral hazard, obviously. Think about it. If you're a bank and you're told you can lend to this country and you have preferred creditor status, um, you're probably not going to take that decision to lend as seriously as if someone said, yeah, and your resources are on the line. In fact, as I said earlier, the minutes of the executive board meeting in which the loan to Greece was approved make it clear that the US, among other countries, was asking for a reaffirmation of the fund's preferred creditor status because they expected that there was going to be a restructuring and they didn't want to have to go to Capitol Hill and explain to uh, Congress people why we needed to recapitalize the fund because the, the loan to Greece had not been repaid. Um, now, obviously eliminating preferred creditor status would be a step toward disciplining the fund. It would be one way to discipline the fund. You can take a rules-based approach, the four criteria. You can take a market-based approach, denying preferred creditor status. That's pretty much exhausting the possibilities, but it's a pretty extreme way to go. It's a very different view of what the fund does from what, for the last 60, 70 years, it's been doing. So it would be a big step. And I think it is a step that only should be taken if a rules-based approach can't be resuscitated. So um, rule out changing the preferred creditor status? I don't think so. I think that needs to be an option that's on the table. If, not, if for no other reason, then eventually, should the fund get involved in more of these um, loans where restructuring is seen as very likely, Eventually, the fund is going to be, the fund's preferred creditor status is going to be questioned. Let's remember, the fund's preferred creditor status is not de jure, it's de facto. It's something everyone has accepted. And when I was doing this paper, I did uh, call my friend Lee Buchheit and I said, so doesn't anyone ever challenge this? He says, oh, they always challenge it. It's just um, in debt restructuring arrangements. Um, it's just that the fund is usually sort of small peanuts, so when some resistance is put up, they just sort of drop it and figure, take on bigger fish. But someday, uh, with, if the fund, if, this were, if Greece were to be a precedent followed in the future, the fund's preferred creditor status will be questioned, and this, this whole issue is going to be opened uh, with all its ugliness. Uh, thank you, Susan. Let me call on uh, Hong Tran, Executive Managing Director of IAF. Well, thank you very much, Domenico. Um, to complement what Anna and Susan uh, just said, I just want to make four points. Number one, um, it is useful in my view in this discussion to keep a distinction between what the fund does and what the market does. The fund is completely within its mandate, its right to define its lending policy and conditionality for lending, including requiring uh, debt restructuring PSI when it deems the observation is that such authority and mandate is already there, particularly in Article 6 of the fund's Articles of Agreement, to spell it out and to hardwire such requirement in any written document is really unnecessarily restrict room for maneuver for, for the fund to deal with crisis. However, that is mentally at least distinct from a contractual matter between the sovereign debtor and its international creditors. They enter into contract for a commercial transaction. Contract should be honored when, for unavoidable reasons, contracts have to be changed. There should be a process whereby the change in contract would be agreed to by both sides of the contracting parties, point number one. Point number two, it is only the reason to support that approach because history since the first sovereign bond restructuring in the modern times, that with Mongolia in 1997, 
34 sovereign bond restructuring, all of them worked, except one. And I don't need to spell out what that one case is. Except one, every bond restructuring worked pretty well. Within 10 months of announcement of restructuring, within seven months on average of starting negotiation, it's consummated. High participation rate, 95%. Whole now litigation, not absolutely not a problem. Coordination problem among diverse set of creditors, absolutely not a problem. 30% of sovereign bond restructuring critics claim resulted in redefault by the sovereign debtor. But it is not different from the 41% redefault rate in the global corporate bond restructuring episodes. The NBV loss in sovereign bond restructuring averaged 47%, but with very wide, high standard deviation of 26%. That means ranging from 5 to 95%. And last but not least, a lot of the bond restructuring usually have maturity extension, some interest rate reduction, and less than half of the time, nominal haircuts. That's the second point. Third point, has such a market approach with such a superior record of 30 to 1 cases being successfully completed, perfect. No, it's not perfect, nor should it be, because breaking contracts is a bad thing, not a good thing, and it should not be made easy or perfect. And then moral hazard and everything, uh, argument, but basically it's not the right thing to make breaking contracts an easy thing to do. When we talk about breaking contracts, we are talking basically about fair burden sharing of the different stakeholders in the process. And we, in the earlier session, talk about the country on the one hand, the international financial institution, international financial community on the other hand, and private sector creditors. Each has to play a role in a fair way, and most importantly, transparent and good faith process to achieve an agreement to share the burden equally. In this context, the debate that we have seen in recent months and weeks, basically making use of the ruling by the, the, the U.S. New York District Court about interpretation of the Pirate Passu Clause and the ratable payment for Argentina bonds, in my view, is very problematic because it leads to misguided effort to really weaken really. We should realize that in sovereign bonds, international private sector creditors already start out with a weak hand dealing with sovereign. And over the years, there has been a steady erosion of investor rights. In Mexico bonds in 2003, first introducing modern CACs in, in modern context, 85% is the threshold for voting to agree to a refactoring. That has been diluted, weakened now to 66 to 3 percent of a meeting with a very low quorum. In other words, as little as one quarter of the bondholders of outstanding bond can impose, by agreeing to a restructuring proposal, can impose its decision on the vast majority of bondholders. It is really not that fair when one comes to think of it. And therefore, to learn from experience and to promote kind of a robust framework to deal with the minority cases when contracts cannot be honored. One really should stress this point of fairness and good faith negotiation between the stakeholders in this process to arrive at a mutually agreed solution. And last point, we ourselves at the IAF, together with colleagues and other organizations, uh, ICMA, International Capital Markets Association in particular, have been working and promoting further enhancement and development of collective action clauses, particularly aggregation clause, where we try to make it even more difficult for a minority of investors to accumulate sufficient position in one bond series with which to obstruct or to hold up uh, restructuring of the bond. Uh, so that is another step in terms of weakening credit rise, but we think that that is worthwhile to make sure that overall the marketplace is, is robust. Perry Pasu clause, we think that it should be clarified to the extent that if the contracting parties really do not want to see the rateable payment ruling by the New York district judge, uh, 
they should say so clearly in their contract. They say by river sewer doesn't mean at all rateable payment. However, if the contracting parties being consulting adults really want to have rateable payments or pro rata payment in their contract, so be it. And you should be interested to know that in the past five years, the volume of international emerging market sovereign bonds more and more contains such explicit pro rata payment obligation by the debtor to their investors. Creditor engagement clause is also important to really make clear that the sovereign debtor, when they get into trouble, should engage with creditors to solve their problem. And last but not least, waiver of sovereign immunity rights in a commercial transaction is a very good thing to do. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Hong, for staying within your allotted time. So I think there are three broader issues. Uh, one is uh, how speci well specified is the IMF's mandate in crisis management and resolution? Uh, how predictable should that uh, uh, crisis framework be? Uh, what to do with the funds uh, preferred creditor status? And uh, finally, how uh, to allow for a distinction of roles between the IMF and markets and uh, safeguarding investor, investor rights? Um, so I think we have uh, time for a few questions. Maybe I would suggest that uh, you raise your hands and identify yourself, and then we'll collect questions in group of uh, two or three. Um, Bill Klein from the Institute. I think a, a particularly crucial point of the IMF decision on Greece was the calculation that at that particular time uh, a forced haircut would have had massive ramifications for the much more important economies uh, of Italy, uh, Spain. And I think it's a little bit m misleading to impose today's tranquility uh, on that moment. This, of course, is the, one of the responses that the Europeans themselves have come back to the critique of the fund. I mean, I think more importantly, going forward, what do you want the fund to do? I think those who suggest that the fund should reinvent the sovereign debt restructuring mechanism implicitly think there's going to be a lot of important uh, insolvencies right around the corner. And they, they implicitly think that Italy is next, uh, and you better set up a more methodical process. I don't think that's the case. Uh, and it's not clear to me that you want to send the wrong signal uh, by setting up uh, a mechanism uh, for the odd case of the small country uh, where it would be a, case, um, a problem. Even in Greece, if you think of policy decisions as a sequential process, there was a significant probability that indeed they could honor the debts that they had. They had a 6% primary surplus target. Oh, outrageous, nobody's ever done it. Well, this was the first industrial country that had defaulted since the 1930s. So who knew what could be done in such unique circumstances, especially with powerful friends in the, in the European community? And at the end of 2011, I wrote a paper projecting that they could, in fact, service the entire debt. It was not insolvency, as long as they could stretch it out, that in, in the first PSI would be sufficient, it could be sufficient. Well, of course, we know that all of the projections went straight downhill, the growth projections, et cetera. If you, if you lie them out, you see successive downgradings. And of course, a lot of that had to do with political unraveling. But the point is, suppose that you were making the decision at that point, and you knew there was a lot of very negative spillover effects. You realize there's some possibility that you can, in fact, validate the solvency through the stretch outs as the first PSI. Not at all obvious to me that we should complacently with the benefit of hindsight, conclude that the fund was hijacked by special interests and everybody knew that there was going to have to be a huge haircut and the only solution going forward is to have a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. Um, thank you, Bill. Uh, Wim Beuter. Uh, just a minor factual correction. Greece was not the first industrial country to default since 1930. Germany, or rather West Germany, defaulted on its internal debt in 1948 and its external debt in 1953. So that's uh, better. Uh, and it did a lot of good. 
I would say, much more even than the, than the Marshall Plan. Um, I, um, I don't understand the argument that uh, um, uh, this is creating an institution like an SDRM that can supplement market-based or voluntary mechanisms like CACs, which are useful, uh, uh, to restructure sovereigns uh, in a way that does the least unnecessary damage, that it should not be done because it might scare the children. Right? I, I find that an extraordinary argument. You want to do it precisely now that things are, are quiet. You want to create it so it's ready. The, the belief that um, uh, after Greece, there are going to be no other takers. Uh, I you know from your mouth to God's ear, Bill, but I, uh, I, I think that uh, unless we have uh, a, a minor miracle in the periphery of the euro area and the sovereigns there, and, uh, sorry, and the countries manage to grow at a nominal GDP growth rate of about 4% from now on average till kingdom come, none of these sovereigns are going to make it. Right? And, this, and the ECB, who is producing negative inflation for the periphery and half a percent for the euro area average, is not helping here. So it effectively requires the periphery to grow at 4% real to keep the sovereign solvent. So I think there are serious question marks behind the solvency of all of the periphery uh, sovereigns, from the biggest, Italy, to the one most likely to escape untouched, which is Ireland, despite its very high debt burden. Um, but it, um, it goes beyond that. I think the, 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 the way in which I think the, um, uh, the IMF and the Europeans fail to address uh, uh, sovereign and sovereign related debt issues. That brings me to the case of Ireland, right, where the sovereign was effectively bullied by, uh, the, um, well, by, the, by the Troika and indeed by the uh, American Secretary of the Treasury into uh, 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 stopping, uh, no, not implementing their plan for bailing in senior unsecured bank creditors, right? Basically, um, uh, the Irish got three phone calls, one from Tricia, one from and one uh, from the American uh, Secretary saying, don't do this. Uh, uh, Tricia because it was unthinkable, surely because the German banks were too exposed, and uh, the American Secretary of the Treasury uh, because of what it would do to uh, US money market funds, who were heavily invested, not in Irish debt per se, but in a European bank debt. So, and again, this systemic contagion I was used for that. I think it was a ca catastrophic error, right? It was um, uh, this time the debt wasn't moved wholesale uh, onto the uh, backs of the international taxpayer, but private debt, again, was moved onto the books of the Irish sovereign and through highly subsidized uh, uh, funding from Europe unto the sovereigns there. I think there's a double argument, uh, a double error there that the, that the IMF contributed to. Not, uh, not solely responsible, but it didn't stop it. It went along with this sad charade. Thank you. Thank you. So we have uh, one question over there and then one more in the back. My name's Sarah Gelinas. I work at Eaton Vance, which is an investment management company based in Boston. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion and uh, the, the topic of SDRM, but I wonder how you ever um, insulate these decisions from politics. I mean, um, you know, Susan, you were speaking about how they waived the four criteria when it came to Greece. We're looking at Ukraine right now, and obviously geopolitical concerns seem to outweigh any economic ones. So how do you ever create a system that can't be waived or can't... Uh, you know, that won't uh, have to be deferred to the, the needs of politics. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, one more question, and then we'll give it a chance uh, to the panelists to react. Thank you. Uh, Landon Thomas, New York Times. Um, I guess I was just on the, on the question of, of surveillance is, is going to ask you guys about the Article 4 um, and why they aren't used more effectively as a, as a warning signal and as a way to, I guess, get people's attention. Um, from my experience, the most I've ever learned about countries' debt and other problems are, are from these Article 4s. Now, um, in fact, the, the Article 4 in Greece in 2009, if you go back and read it, is very critical. I later learned that it had been um, massaged a bit uh, 
um, by the Greek representative on the uh, executive board. So I guess it seems to me the crucial question is that the, it, why can't these uh, extremely well done, uh, rigorous assessments of, of a country's economic well-being uh, be more forceful and, I guess, uh, resist the tampering because in every case the actual draft has to go through, uh, has to be approved by the country that is being monitored, which in effect sort of you, you lose the whole purpose. So the, the criticism really doesn't go far enough. Thank you. So I would uh, now call uh, the panelists in reverse order. Hong, you first. Thank you. Only two responses and uh, leave time for my colleagues to uh, respond as well. Number one, um, SDAM, SODO, SDAM, SDAM light treaty approach, statute approach, they are either unnecessary or unworkable. It goes completely contrary to uh, domestic U.S. Um, uh, corporate um, or municipality restructuring process, Chapter 9 or Chapter 11, where both the debtor and the bondholders subject to the ruling of the bankruptcy judge of course subject to appeal to the appeal court but basically they are bound by the judge a sovereign is not bound by anybody except its parliament because it is sovereign and therefore no treaty no sdam no whatever will work if the sovereign debtor chooses to behave in a unilateral way like the single case that i highlighted before one out of 34 Nothing will work. No treaty, no SLM will work. If the sovereign data, however, like in the 33 other cases, choose to behave in a collaborative way, no treaty is necessary. Point number two to Landon's. That's why I asked the question in the first session about the tension between sharing information and assessment by fund, fund staff and, and the fear or the sensitivity that that could inadvertently trigger the precise crisis that, that the whole exercise is designed to avoid. Uh, two possible remedy, one is more transparency, disclosure of quality data, timely data, so everyone will know there's no hidden surprise in terms of you know, exposure of the country to unsustainable level of debt or, or, or off-balance sheet obligations. So more transparency and disclosure. And secondly, my pet, Suggestion is making the publication of Article 4 country reports mandatory and not up to the country to decide. Has to be published. Country can have a few pages to rebut the view of staff, but every Article 4 assessment country report has to be published. Thank you. Anna? Okay. Um, thank you for the questions and i also want to quickly react to a couple of uh things that uh, we talked about on the panel um first on access criteria and possible fixes i think this is a, a a case of tool confusion right you have a situation where the fear is contagion or at least the stated fear is contagion you can believe it or not believe it but you're worried about italy and spain and your solution is to lend to greece Right, that to me is the problem, right? It sounds to me like what you need is tools to make funding available to Italy and Spain to, yeah, and this is the liquidity solvency issue, right? So you need more imaginative tools to deal with contagion and true uh, liquidity concerns rather than um, pile it on onto the one uh, insolvent uh, country. Um, on weakening creditor rights, I think that the trajectory is not entirely uh, clear. Because collective action clauses, you could just as easily argue, was a strengthening of creditor rights. Um, so Mexico starts with 75% uh, of outstanding. But no, Mexico is 75, Brazil is 85. Um, but the, um, at that time, in the UK, you could amend um, you could amend with, you know, 66% of a quorum at a delayed meeting, dot, 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 with 20%, right? The evolution of CAC since 2003 has almost obliterated that option and has made exit consents more difficult. So in fact, the whole point of contractual innovation is that it actually proceeds in a much more balanced way that is, you know, you can sort of call it weakening, but actually if you look at what changed in the contracts, um, you can easily argue that on balance it has become harder 
uh, for debtors to restructure, and that may be actually a terrific thing, um, depending on where you sit. Um, SDRM is just simply not on the table. So an SDRM is a very particular institutional con the construct from 2003 that some people may like, some people may not like, but it is uh, nowhere uh, on the agenda. I think there's a separate and interesting question about what institutional innovations we need in the sovereign debt restructuring space, but this is not an SDRM discussion. That is a red herring. Um, I think that you do not ever insulate this process from politics. That's the point. It is irreducibly political at the core. And then the design focus has to be on improving accountability mechanisms. And there I think I agree with my colleagues very much that transparency is certainly a good thing, but you also, transparency involves trade-offs. And uh, you know, if you publish more Article 4s and quicker, um, the argument is they're not going to say as much as you'd like them to say. I happen to think that in most cases it's a worthwhile trade-off, but I think we need to recognize it as such. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you, Anna. Susan? OK, thanks. Um, on the question of, um, I think it went off. OK. So as I said, I did this project last year on examining, interviewing 30 to 40 people who were key figures in the decision to change the criteria within the fund permanently and to lend to Greece, even though it was not expected that debt was to be sustainable. These were people in Greece, officials in Greece, officials in other European countries, in European institutions, in the IMF, in the United States government, a lot of different people. Most of them spoke um, on the condition of anonymity. I would say, and, and I, I really want to emphasize that I didn't go with an agenda except to ask a few questions equally of everyone in as objective a way as it was possible. Obviously, contagion was the big issue. What was the decision to lend to Greece necessary because the contagion uh, threat was so serious? Actually, surprisingly, in the end, uh, with the exception of one very important person, the view was, yeah, contagion was a big concern, but uh, probably it was overblown, not just with the benefit of hindsight, but probably even at the time. People worked themselves into a frenzy of concern about contagion. And the second response was typically, oh, contagion happened. I mean, in the end, the decisions to lend to Greece did not stop Spain and Italy from falling into pretty serious straits. And it's not clear it would have been worse. Um, and it probably definitely would have been a shorter crisis had the path taken in Greece not been started. Um, on the SDRM and whether this is, I mean, there isn't going to be an SDRM. I agree with Anna completely. But to sort of, I mean, clearly the fund is in the process of trying to revitalize the, the debate about an SDRM-like um, instrument. And even within the European Union, you see, um, well, in Bruegel, for example, you see questions being asked about whether a European SDRM um, is needed. Okay. First of all, I think a lot of people um, talking about this are rather imprecise in making it clear that, that restructuring should not happen. I mean, in general, countries should honor their debt commitments. But there are some cases where it's impossible without massive political risks. And in those cases, you've got to face facts and do it. Would it be a bad signal now? I tend to agree with Willem on this. I think it's precisely the signal that is needed right now to get people to focus on what's going to happen if things don't work out. We are, after all, poised right now on the cutting edge of weak growth and the potential rise in interest rates. I mean, what combination of those is going to happen is not clear, but there are many adverse scenarios that are very plausible. Um, it's, it's quite possible that it all works out fine, that we get a slow but steady recovery, interest rates rise gradually, the world adjusts. But we have got a lot of countries with very high debt ratios, and to the extent that this balance doesn't work out right, we're going to be in trouble, and we're going to have a lot of debt crises. And 
It seems to me if there is anything that the fund can do that's useful, it's anticipate what institutions and procedures are going to be necessary to deal with the problems if they arise. So I, 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 it seems to me all the arguments point toward getting this question on the table as quickly as possible. Now, Willem also raises this issue about um, distribution, that by taking this course in Greece, um, basically what you were doing is setting yourself up to socialize um, Greece's debt to take, it, take that from the private sector, put it in, onto the shoulders of taxpayers. And, and of course that's right. I mean, of course we're seeing it. That's, that goes without saying. But I have to say, I do ask whether it's the fund's role to prevent that. After all, if the Europeans decide the way out of their mess is for Greece to um, repay its private creditors and shift the debt to uh, European taxpayers, why is the IMF to say you're, you shouldn't be doing that? I, I, it seems to me, um, even though you know personally that wouldn't be my choice, I do think the IMF, as not a supranational organization but an international organization, is not in a place to say that's not appropriate. Where I think the IMF did renege on its responsibility was to resolve a crisis that has been very costly for the global economy, not just for the European economy, as quickly and expeditiously as possible. Politics, um, obviously, everybody has admitted politics are always and everywhere going to be present in IMF decisions, not least on in debt crises. But I think it's not politics or no politics. It's where on the spectrum of a very political set of decisions um, the decisions are actually made. Um, and then you have to ask yourself the next question is, what is the value added of an international organization like the IMF? Well, it seems to me, if you just say it's a, a, a reserve pooling operation, well then, you know, what do you need to have that big building and those thousands of economists employed? I mean, there's no point, it's a big waste. But when you really think about it, you've got to say the value out of the IMF is to be able to offer as objective advice as is possible on crises or surveillance or whatever other issue you want to take up. Politics will always be involved, but if you can't put in place some firewalls between what the IMF says and does and what the political influences within the IMF are, then I think basically you have a big waste of money on your hands within the IMF. Um, and finally, on the question um, from Landon about the surveillance in Greece in 2009, yeah, I mean, the, the, most of these things were written down and it was kind of anticipated that, well, certainly it was stated that Greece was very vulnerable. But, you know, there are a lot of countries that get um, pegged as very vulnerable and the one that we always point to is Lebanon, which had a debt ratio of uh, well over 200% of GDP and for literally years, a decade, the IMF said Lebanon is a crisis waiting to happen and Lebanon is just fine. So it, it is always going to be true, as was said in the first session, that um, the IMF doesn't have the, the surefire answers to every economic problem. It can raise questions about vulnerability. It can put countries in different classes of vulnerability, but that's pretty much the end of um, surveillance. Okay, and uh, on this very reassuring note, uh, let me end the panel here and we are going to adjourn for a coffee break. Thank you. <laughs>